And here we have Daniel Kim. He's going to be talking about debugging LLMs in production with OpenTelemetry. Take, take it off. Oh, same great team as Reese, who's in the audience and who just gave a great talk with Alex. Um, and I want to preface this whole talk by saying that I'm extremely new to the AI world. And the first time I actually touched AI was a month and a half ago at a arts and crafts AI hackathon in San Francisco, where me and my friend Lizzie uh, built an app that leveraged LLMs uh, to translate the top headlines in San Francisco in a Gen Z voice. And then we replicated my favorite YouTuber, Trisha Paytas' voice. And we, had, we used Twilio to randomly call people in the voice of Trisha Paytas explaining the housing crisis in very Gen Z terms. So that was the first project that I built that won me third place at the Arts and Crafts Hackathon. So I was very proud of it. And I was like, wow, like, it's so easy to build with LLMs because there's all of these abstractions and open source projects that make it so easy to get started. So I wanted to talk a little bit about building apps with LLMs and also how to leverage existing technologies like OpenTelemetry to build better apps with guide rails so you don't get unpredictable wild called answers all the time and can somehow put it into production without getting a heart attack every time it returns something crazy. So that's kind of like the premise of the whole talk. So if you're any company that is tech or tech adjacent, you have probably been in a meeting where a VP is like, guys, we need to really put AI into our app. Like, I don't know how, but it needs to happen yesterday. So it is this gift that I think is very accurate, at least for our company, of how AI was rolled out. Um, and that is a thing that I think almost every one of my friends that work in tech have faced. So what are some of the ways that companies are applying LLMs to their systems currently? So I can talk about how New Relic, my company, is integrating LLMs into our systems. So our platform is extremely big and complex and has a pretty steep learning curve. So you need to know like our proprietary um, querying language and you also need to know our UI to try to get data and information and helpful things out of our platform. But we can leverage LLMs to allow folks without all that deep experience to get value out of, their platform, value out of our platform without knowing our UI and just use natural language queries. So here are some examples. So I can ask our generative AI assistant, Grok, how many logs I ingested yesterday without having to navigate four different screens to our managing our log section and just return the answer in a chat format. I'm also able to ask it things like, how do I do X on our platform? And it'll return a great little snippet without me having to navigate our doc site. So these are a couple of things that we do to make our platform more accessible, leveraging the power of LLMs. So this sounds all good at dandy, right? Like, what's the catch? What makes it difficult to do this? Because if it were that easy to integrate into every system, we would have LLMs in every single app. So the first problem that happens when you try to integrate LLMs into production is that LLMs has this really fun little quirky thing it does, which is hallucinate. And it's easily seen when you give it very simple math problems. It's actually kind of funny. So when I give ChatGPT this first grade math problem on subtracting fractions, it actually does all of this confident step-by-step -step processing, but it ends up with the wrong answer. It says, if you subtract three and one quarters from one and three quarters, it gives you one and, uh, three and one half. And this is ChatGPT like in the newest version. This was done two weeks ago. But when I rerun the query, it gives me the correct answer. So what can we learn from this? So first, LLMs are terrible at math, and also they're extremely unreliable. So when you're working with technologies that are not able to do very simple things, but able to present the wrong answer extremely confidently, you need to have some guide rails in place so things like this aren't being shown to your paying customers. The second thing that uh, LLMs struggle with are limiting by the training data. So ChatGPT constantly updates their training data, but at the time of writing this slide, which was three weeks ago, 
Um, the OpenAI training data cut off in 2020. I think they have updated that now to 2022. So that means that it can't answer questions about things that are happening in the real world right now. So this is one of my favorite new rappers of 2023, Ice Spice. And if I ask who is Ice Spice to ChatGPT, it has no idea who it is. So let's say you want to ask your LLM or you want to leverage new data in your systems. It has no idea what it is without the right context. So what is the solution to both make LLMs good at math and also be able to access current and relevant information? The first thing you can do is something called retrieval augmentation, which is by feeding it the right data and context to answer your particular question. So when you're asking it about iSpice, maybe giving it also a Wikipedia article on who iSpice is can help answer that question. Or giving it internal documents uh, of your platform and giving that as context to your LLM can help, uh, help your LLM answer questions about new relics, um, how to instrument something with New Relic, uh, how to instrument an AWS Lambda function with New Relic. You can also give LLMs the power to interact with the real world using tools. So let's say an LLM doesn't know a piece of information, like for example, who iSpice is. Giving it the ability to perform a search on Google to figure out who iSpice is, or being able to instead outsource the math portion of its query to a calculator, or being able to proactively search documentation pages if it doesn't know how to do something, or if I ask it, what should I wear today in Chicago, being able to query the weather API to get that information, this gives it superpowers to be able to answer queries that it may not have the original context for in its original training. And building this sounds really complicated, but there are so many open source libraries out there that really abstract the difficulty out of it, so you can actually build all of this in a couple lines of code. And I wanted to introduce Langchain, which is one of the most popular Python and JavaScript libraries to build these types of AI applications that is open, fully open source. There are a couple of alternatives like Llama Index that you can explore, but Langchain, I think, has the most community around it. So that's why I built it in the hackathon with Langchain. And to build an AI agent is deceptively simple. All you have to do to initialize an AI agent to be able to answer your queries is one line of Python code. And I want to break down what this line of Python code does. So the first thing that you can do is give it tools. So let's say I want my LLM to be able to ask questions to a search engine and get information to be able to answer a particular query. All I have to do is use a Langchain utility that is a DuckDuckGo search API wrapper, import that, write a very simple two-line Python function just running a query, and then initialize an array called tools, where I name the particular tool, call the function, and most importantly, give it a natural language description on when the agent should be able to use this particular tool. So I said, useful for when you need to answer questions about current events, you should ask targeted questions. And this is how the agent knows when to use the tool. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later. In the LLM, what all you have to do to leverage an LLM with Langchain is to import the LLM library uh, uh, and the specific technology you want to use. So all you have to do, if you want to use OpenAI, is do from langchain.llms import OpenAI. And to initialize the uh, LLM, all you have to do is write the single line of code where you specify the API key and the specific temperature. Here, you can also leverage multiple LLMs, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and all you have to do to do that is put this into an array, just like we did for tools. And finally, for agent, you can specify how you want your agent to go about answering your uh, natural language queries. And Langchain comes out of the box with six different agent types. And this is kind of crazy because all this particular thing is, is natural language. So this piece of natural language, it's not even a code block, it's just like lines of words. This is basically telling the agent, here are the thought processes that you need to have to be able to answer any natural language query. So answer the following questions as best as you can. You have access to the following tools. And then you should always format your thoughts as a question, thought, action, action input, observation, thought, and final answer. So these are the steps that I want my agent to go through to be able to answer a particular question. And the thing is that you can modify this prompt to whatever you want depend to fit your specific use case. So if you're building an LLM for you know, answering questions in the form of a Gen Z YouTuber, you can 
add that to the prompt, and it will do whatever you say. So all of this technology is so advanced that all you have to do is use English to be able to specify what you want the particular agent to do. So if I go and ask how old is iSpice to my new LangChain application, here's the thought process that goes on. So this might look very similar to a trace, which is foreshadowing for what this talk will be about. So uh, let's say that I query my application, how old is iSpice to, uh, to the, my LangChain application. My LangChain application will then call the GPT 3.5 Turbo API, asking which tool should I use given this particular question. And then because ChatGP, uh, sorry, GPT 3.5 doesn't know who iSpice is, it will be like, hey, I need more context. Please use the search tool to gather more information so I can answer this question. Then LangChain, given this new input, searches DuckDuckGo leveraging the tool we just built and returns the relevant paragraphs being like, iSpice is a 23-year-old rapper, you know, known for her breakout singles, you know, X and Y. And then given this additional context, LangChain calls the GPT 3.5 API with answer the question, in this case, how old is iSpice, using and then inserting all of the returned context from DuckDuckGo. And then it returns the right answer given that right context. So iSpice is 23 years old. So that's how we get to the final answer. So this is a very simple example, right? But what if I give it a more complicated example that can kind of trip it up? So what is iSpice's age divided by the number of Nick <laughs> Cannon's kids? So what happens when you ask my lane chain app this? And things start to break down a little bit. Um, so this is the actual logs of what happens, the step-by-step -step process to solve this particular problem. And if you zoom in closely here, it assumes that iSpice is 42 years old because it doesn't split up the query into two separate queries. It has one giant query to both determine how many kids Nick Cannon has as well as how old iSpice is. And this is wrong, right? Because iSpice is 23 years old. Um, so LLMs are really unreliable because it can pretend to do a lot of great things, but it ultimately is unpredictable and it can sometimes arrive at the right answer, but sometimes not. So if you're a customer of my LangChain app that answers questions about iSpice's age, I don't really care what part your LangChain agent messed up in to return the wrong answer. Like, I only care that the answer to my very important question is wrong. So how, as a developer that's making these types of apps, how do I make sure that this egregious error doesn't happen again? So we should definitely get more visibility into our AI applications. So that's where tracing comes in. Um, so tracing is basically the idea that you can go, uh, trace, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say trace. You should observe a request as it goes end to end, input to output through an entire system. And this is really great if you want to identify what part of your system is a bottleneck or contains errors. So this is an example of a trace of how my amazing lane chain application came to the final answer that is wrong. And I can see right here in this particular trace that this particular open API call made the wrong, returned the wrong answer. So this is a great way to figure out, okay, what part of the process broke down for me to return the wrong answer? And this is a very silly example, I admit, but if we're talking about really production environments where whatever your LLM required, uh, returns is like part of an SLA or with an agreement with a customer, it's actually very important that you minimize wrong hallucinations and wrong answers because that could ultimately affect your bottom line. So that's where open telemetry comes in. And this is a way that you can collect tracing data from your applications. It's a CNCF open source project. There's been so many awesome talks about it today and yesterday about the project. Um, so I'm not gonna go too in depth about it because you have those great talks to refer back to, but it is basically an open source standard for instrumentation. So it's a way that you can collect trace data, metrics, and logs from your applications in a multitude of languages. And the great thing about it is that you can export it to whoever you want, whether it's a vendor like New Relic or an open source monitoring solution like Jaeger. So getting started with open telemetry, you have two main options. I mean, you could definitely use the API and the spec, but if you are a developer on a, on a rush, I would not suggest building your own agent with the open, a, uh, open telemetry API. That is very, very difficult. So when it comes to like normal people stuff, uh, <laughs> you can leverage the Python SDK to do either automatic instrumentation or manual instrumentation. And the great thing about automatic instrumentation is that it is automatic. 
Uh, so you can, all you have to do is kind of install it and it starts exporting data immediately. The downside is that you can't add custom attributes or custom spans to be get better visibility into what's actually going on. So when you're trying to debug and you only have access to automatically generated traces, you might kind of run into a brick wall, which we'll see in the next slide. Also, the automatic instrumentation is only available in select languages. Thankfully, Python is one of them. Um, but, but if you if your library doesn't have automatic instrumentation, you're kind of out of luck there. With manual instrumentation, this is available for pretty much every language that I could think of, but there's probably one that it doesn't have coverage for. In that case, you should definitely use the Open Telemetry APIs to write your own instrumentation so someone else can use it. Uh, but in this case, with manual instrumentation, you can customize spans and add additional attributes, which makes it really awesome for debugging. So with automatic instrumentation, all you have to do to get started is add the right Python packages and then run the particular app with a couple of things enabled, like for example, where you want to export the traces, what you want the service name to be, and what the endpoint you should export it to. So it's relatively straightforward. But what you get is kind of what you put into it. So you get the duration, you get like what endpoint it calls, and that's, if that's good enough for your needs, it's great. It works out of the box and it took you five minutes to install. But let's say I want to really figure out like what step went wrong when going through that Nick Cannon's kids and Ice Spice problem. Like this would not be that helpful when I'm trying to debug that. So that's where manual instrumentation comes in. So you have to, uh, instead of like automatic instrumentation where you just have to go into your command line and then like import a bunch of stuff and then run it. This, you actually have to edit your code. So you have to import a bunch of libraries. You have to set the trace provider, initialize it, and then actually specify which spans you want it to record. If you want more information about how to do this, please go to the docs. They're great about how to get started with Python instrumentation. So that's how you get started. So let's leverage now Python manual instrumentation to add more context, add more vibes to the particular trace. So, like I said, with uh, automatic instrumentation, you get a couple of things out of the box, like the service name, the parent ID, the trace ID, and the duration. So you basically get how long it took and who it called, but you don't get much else. But let's say I want to know how many tokens this particular call used, or what was the prompt that you actually inserted into GPT 3.5 to get the wrong answer, or the specific uh, temperature that the LLM is tuned to. So with manual instrumentation, all you have to do is set the span attribute to be the particular thing that you want to measure, and then just get that particular value from the API call that gets returned from your particular LLM. So that's all you have to do to add additional context. So here I can add as many attributes as I want, or I want to pay for it to my observability provider. Um, so here I am just initializing how many total tokens that this used, but you can add, of course, additional attributes. If you are too lazy to do all of that because you're like, I don't know if I want to commit to all of this custom instrumentation, there's an awesome open source uh, repo called Open LLMetry. Great name, but Google always <laughs> uh, auto corrects it. But it's a wrapper around the Open Telemetry Python SDK to automatically instrument parts of the AI stack. So it will automatically add attributes that this maintainer thinks is important to your various calls, so you don't actually have to do all the manual instrumentation. So the experience is very similar to automatic instrumentation, but you get all the added value of manual instrumentation. So if you want to get started quickly and get a lot of information, I would definitely suggest installing this repo and putting it into your apps. So now that we've gone through like building the app, instrumenting the app, I have the data. So now what do we do with all of this mountains of data that's in your observability provider or Jaeger or whatever. So let's first talk about table stakes. These are things that you can get five minutes after you start getting data out of your system. So the, obviously you can start tracking things like duration, so how long each request took. You can also start tracking errors, and these errors are very interesting in the case of LLMs because they're easily fixable. So this is a particular error I got while I was building my iSpice app. It's literally just a lane chain chat like app but I like to call it the Ice Spice app because all the questions I asked it was about Ice Spice. Um, <laughs> so I got this particular error, and this was very fascinating because I ran the same query through the app 20 times, and this was the only time that it showed this error. And this error says, unknown format from LLM. 
this particular thing that we shove into Python does not compute. So all we have to do to fix this is basically tell in my prompt, hey, format it so it doesn't use num express.evaluate because my calculator tool doesn't like that and format it in Y format. Like that's all you have to do to fix this kind of thing. So honestly, like half the battle is identifying what the edge case is and the issues are so you can add it to the prompt so it doesn't do it again. So that's tracking errors with tracing with OpenTelemetry. And this is the big kahuna, is tracking costs, because LLMs can get really expensive really quickly. And if you want to be a profitable app, which is, I'm assuming, everyone who runs a company, you really want to track your COGS or your cost of goods sold. So whenever I use OpenAI, I go to their dashboard to figure out how much money I've used in my, in my account. And it's very vague about what, where the money is coming from. It just tells you, oh, you spent 50 cents today. But if I have a specific spike, how do I know what's causing the spike? Especially if you're running multiple you know, AI apps with multiple users, how do I figure out what the cause of the spike is so I can bring it down to what the average is? So tracking token usage is really important. So let's say I'm the developer and I send a, uh, open API, uh, sorry, I send a query to, uh, to GPT 3.5. Red is my favorite color. I don't know why I sent that, but that's what I sent. And what happens when I send this like, set of sentences or characters is that when it receives it, it automatically converts it to a set of numbers in an array or a vector using a tokenization algorithm. Some providers use an open source tokenizing algorithm. OpenAI doesn't. So it just uses a proprietary way that it does it. And the, the algorithm changes based on the model that you use. So if you go to platform.openai.com slash tokenizer, you can actually have a little playground where you can insert whatever you want to send to OpenAI, and it will tell you how many tokens it took. And tokens are really important because that's how they charge. That's their billing model. So every single character that you send into the API gets charged at a certain rate. So here it's $0.0015 per 1,000 tokens. And every single character that outputs from the API, so it's both ends, it gets charged $0.002 per 1K tokens. But this gets really complicated because depending on the context window size or the API that you use, the pricing dynamically shifts. So it's extremely important that you know first where you're sending your requests and also what the settings are and how many tokens, how many characters you're sending into the API. Because if you accidentally send it to the wrong endpoint with the wrong settings, you can double or quadruple your price with receiving pretty much the same result. So with manual and custom instrumentation, you're able to actually track for every single call that my application makes to OpenAI, how many tokens are used for completion, which is basically the output, and uh, the prompt tokens, which is the input. And it also adds it together nicely to get 263 here. So this way, what you can do is now, now that you have the data in an observability provider, you can start making queries towards it. So if you have a spike, you can try to figure out what are the patterns in the high usage queries so I can bring it down. So you can query for clues. So if there are high standard deviation, that means, hey, is there a couple of butthole users that are using my app that are giving it really weird queries that are spiking up my usage? Or is there a rise in token uses after a specific code change or a prompt change? Or what are the inputs and outputs of the largest token usage traces to figure out what the commonality might be? So it's a lot of investigating, just like what observability is, to try to figure out what the root cause of a specific spike might be. Oh, shoot, I just clicked the wrong button. Now comes the fun part. So if this is all table stakes. These are things that you can do out of the box right after you start reporting data. But these are some of the more fun things you can do, like experimentation. So here is a specific query that went wrong a little bit. So this is a specific response from OpenAI. It says, I now know the answer. Taylor Swift is 31, and Nick Cannon has 12 kids. So the product of their ages and the number of kids is 360. That is wrong. But it's very confidently wrong, but it's wrong. But if you see in the trace here, there's no mention of a calculator tool. Even though I gave it the ability to do math, because OpenAI thinks that it is like the bee's knees, it thinks that it can still do math. So what can you do when something like this happens? 
you can do prompt engineering. So remember that little um, text thing that I mentioned of that like that is kind of like the instruction set for your LLM agent. So let me bring that up. All you have to do is add, add specific instructions to do or not do what you want it to do. So I added, unfortunately, you are terrible at math. When provided with math questions, no matter how simple, you should always refer to your tools and absolutely do not try to answer math questions by itself. <laughs> I am being completely serious. This is how you modify prompts to fix errors like this. And then after that, oh, so after that, happily ever after. It always used the calculator tool, so I never had that issue again. However, these changes seem easy to make, right? But they come with trade-offs, right? Because I noticed that when I switched to this new prompt, there was additional tokens added per query. So basically, all of these changes, you can't just make in a vacuum because every single thing has a chain reaction when it comes to LLMs. So it's very important that you have visibility into the downstream impacts that even a small change may make. Because a single two lines added to a prompt can lead to a 20, 30% increase in the number of tokens used. And you don't want to be surprised with a bill just because you gave it a silly little you know, like prompt prefix you know, that just spikes your cost. This is a little bit more hard, because that was a little bit more fun, but let's talk really about proving ROI and increasing ROI of your AI apps. And we use OpenAI as an example, right? And even with just using OpenAI, there's multiple options when it comes to using uh, one of their models. You have 3.5, 4, 3.5 Turbo, so many things with different pricing models. But OpenAI aren't the only kids on the block. There's also Anthropic, AWS, all of these providers that have closed source LLM offerings that you can just query with an API. But where things get really fun and exciting is that there are open source LLMs as well that are released from Meta, Mosaic, et cetera, et cetera. And you can host these models on infrastructure providers like Replicate, Hugging Face, AnyScale, or AWS, where you can actually host your own models. And that means that you don't know what the best option for your business may be until you try it out, because something could be half the price and still offer the same functionalities as something you're using currently. So A-B testing LLM performance is really important when you want to try to find the right LLM for the job. So let's say I, I import langchain.llms, um, I import the OpenAI library, I import the Anthropic library, and I import a Meta Llama 2 model hosted on a provider like Replicate. So that's how you do it in Langchain. And I shove it all into a array, and then I start sending 33% of traffic to each LLM provider, and I monitor it. I can then track token usage cost, percent of user satisfied, prompt response quality, and a bunch of other metrics to figure out what is the most cost effective and accurate responses that is returned by any one of these LLMs. So this makes it really easy to choose based on empirical data what will work best for your application. And the thing is that unlike shopping for like a regular SaaS vendor, you really don't know what models work best for your use case until you try it out because every use case is so different, right? Like Home Depot implementing a chatbot for buying power tools will be very different, obviously, than New Relic's generative AI assistant trying to help people instrument their applications. You know, these use cases are very different. And the thing is that you don't know what will work best for you until you try it out. So being able to A-B test all of these offerings and then being able to do so with three lines of code in Python makes it really accessible, I think, and pretty awesome to be able to find the right solution for your problem. So I want to, before I get to my closing thoughts, I want to add a huge caveat to my talk, which is that we're all assuming here that you're using models hosted by OpenAI, AWS Anthropic, so these are all managed providers. But if you host your own models, things start, like stuff goes down because you have to now not only manage all the things I talked about in my talk, but also the infrastructure costs, latency, bottlenecks. Like what if you get just too many requests to your LLM and like you just can't handle the requests anymore and you have to scale that? Like it just turns into a whole other infrastructure problem. So I want to just caveat this talk by saying I'm only talking about hosted managed solutions with LLMs. If we're talking about hosting your own models, this would be a three-hour talk. So I don't want that to, we have lunch, so we can't do that. Um, so that's kind of like my talk. Um, so here are some of my closing thoughts about LLMs. 
AI apps are still apps, okay, that, that are written in language here. So if you have a LangChain app written in Python, like the iSpice app, even though it uses some cool technology, all the principles that we learned from decades of production engineering still apply. So if you can still use technologies like OpenTelemetry, Prometheus, all of these like things that we've kind of like ground our gears on when we we're supporting millions of users, we can still apply that to the same things because it's just an API call that's the difference. Tracing gives you a good idea of what part of your apps are broken or slow. Also, these are all Dolly generated. And yesterday I wanted fried chicken, so that's why it's all chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so tracing gives you a good idea of what parts of your apps are broken or slow, and it's great because having a glimpse into how uh, uh, how a framework like LangChain goes from a query and browse, uses all of its tools to arrive to a solution, it's really cool to figure out what part of that decision-making process went wrong for the end result to be wrong. And that is not only cool, but also imperative. You want to actually improve reliability and the results going forward. So definitely tracing is great, and I love that I can apply things like tracing, which is traditionally used in just regular environments, into cool things like AI. And finally, LLMs are Pandora's box. Um, it can add a lot of value very, very quickly, right? Because you can get started with five lines of Python, but they're really unpredictable. And that's where really like the hard stuff comes in. It's not deploying it. It's not getting it up and running. It's about quality control and adding guardrails so you're able to use it in a predictable way to your enterprise clients without getting yelled at, without getting weird responses, without having a million support tickets. That's the hard part. So it's up to us all that are developing with LLMs to add guide rails and guidelines to our applications to make sure that they return things that are good and not hallucinate. So those are my final closing thoughts. Um, I tweet at Learn with Daniel or X, I X at Learn with Daniel. Uh, let's be friends. Um, and then uh, me, Reese, and Honeycomb and Observe IQ are hosting a happy hour tomorrow after Observability Day at Spin. It's right next to the venue, apparently. This will say that it's sold out, but please come because uh, we, we just event brights hard. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm here for questions. Are you going to ask if he got us fried chicken? Because I want to know if he got us fried chicken and where. Just before lunch, I'll keep this short. Um, just wondering, super quick, uh, I guess this is a two, two part question, it's related. Do you sample at 100% for your traces? And number two, to close the loop on traces, uh, LLM answers, as you pointed out, sometimes they hallucinate and it's hard to quantify. It's not like a status code you can pick up on. So, how do you close the loop of this was wrong, now we need to investigate using the traces. That's a great question. So first of all, I work for a company called New Relic, which means I have an unlimited pro account. That means I can import as many traces as I, my heart desires. And that might not be the case for you. So I feel like if you are working on an LLM app and it's in staging or if it's in private beta, you should definitely not sample because that's a smaller data set. But of course, if you're pushing it out to production, unless you want half of your IT budget to go to observability, which is great for us, um, then I would highly suggest tracing. Uh, and with tracing, what you can do is that you can use the OpenTelemetry collector to filter out only responses that are labeled in a certain way. And that goes to answer your second question, which is, how do I know if something is good or bad? So there's a couple ways you can do this. So the first easiest way is to ask feedback from the user. So if you use ChatGPT, you can tell like after a response is given, there's a little thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, so that's an easy way to collect it. It's like user satisfaction. A more interesting and newer way to collect that kind of feedback is through using LLMs to evaluate LLMs. So you can actually have a model that evaluates the inputs and outputs of your, uh, uh, of your app to figure out if it's good or bad using analysis. Um, I don't know exactly how they do it because I only have just implemented it, but that's something that's possible. Um, so that's how you do it. And then what you do is that once you take that data, whether it's from the user or another evaluator LLM, that's what they call it, you can embed it into your trace directly. So when someone clicks that like down button, you can attach that as a custom attribute to your trace. So you can actually filter all of your traces by, oh, user sentiment is bad. Or the LLM evaluator chain has determined that this was a bad response. And that's where tail-based sampling comes in where you can actually filter by all the traces 
that have a, either a bad user review, bad, bad user feedback, or like bad uh, feedback from the evaluator chain. And you can just get that data, which would be a lot less than all the successful ones, of course. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Daniel.